Hello and welcome to episode one of the Away End Show brought to you by the Elite Football Show. This is a brand new show that we're doing every single week where we bring on a rival fan and we discuss the fixture ahead for Manchester United. And I'm joined today by my usual co-host, Kieran. Kieran, happy Friday, mate. How are you doing? Happy Friday. I have had work off today, so it is great. I am refreshed and ready for the weekend. Yes, love it. You were knackered last night when we did the oh, fantasy. <laughs> show. You're falling half asleep. Maybe I was boring you, but I've got a fantastic guest today, Tom Overend. He's a Chelsea content creator. He's the owner of all things Chelsea, and he is a level-headed Chelsea fan, so I'm absolutely buzzing to talk about Chelsea with you. Tom, welcome to the Away End Show. You're our first ever guest on this particular show, and how are you doing today, mate? Oh, I'm honoured to be a first guest on your show. I'm doing well just finished work, but ask me after the game how I'm doing. I'm not so sure I'll be as happy. <laughs> That's going to be the same for us. Look, I think we're in we're in a similar situation. I look at Man United and Chelsea in very, very similar circumstances. I think, as you said off camera, I think United are further ahead in their development. You're looking at two managers who are relative, relatively inexperienced. They mirror each other as they're both legends of the clubs as well. They were both brought in, I think, not necessarily on their managerial pedigree i would say they're both been brought in reputation i think ollie was brought into the stop gap that's worked in a lot of aspects but um talk to me a little bit about how you feel about chelsea's start to the season because from the outside i i don't think it's been how i expected i expected you guys to be a lot stronger if i'm being honest well i think a lot of fans in our fan base a lot of fans generally expected us to just be up there with liverpool and city immediately Reality was, with very little pre-season, that was unlikely to happen, I think. Um, I think the fact that, say, Havertz had about a week before the first Premier League fixture, then played, and then Werner coming in, Ziyech coming in. Yes, they trained with the boys towards the end of last season, but it wasn't the same as competitive match training. Um, so it's not been the best start to the season, I'll happily say that. But I'm not going to put all my eggs in there. We're a failed team or we're a busted flush because I think we've got brilliant players. We've just got to kind of get them in, get a system sorted and we'll be fine and dandy before long. Yeah, you bring up a fantastic point. I'm going to bring Kieran in here. The pre-season point. This is something fans definitely overlook. I overlooked it to an extent as well early on. United have had as well a patchy start to the season. I'd say it's not been a particularly good start at all. You know, the PSG result was fantastic and that's more like the United that we want to see, Kieran. But that lack of pre-season is killing everyone. We're looking at the results going around the league, Villa beat Liverpool 7-2. United lost to Spurs and Jose 7-1. We really do need to take that into account when we're looking at some of the new players that Chelsea and United have brought in, don't we? Yeah, it's difficult, not only for new players, but also to kind of... for these players that are normally used to getting those kind of two or three weeks off and for those weeks off to be literally them not having to do any sort of football activity. But most players, prob especially in the bigger teams, got about a week off to go away and then are straight into internationals and straight back into big club games. Like you think of it, the Champions League started within three to four weeks of the start of the season. Normally that doesn't happen because they've started in August and they have the Champions League in October. That it's it's one of those that it's really a continuation of last season. So you're going to see a lot of inconsistent performances. So really, you have to expect the teams with the best depth are probably going to be the most consistent. It's kind of why I've been surprised at Man City because when you look at their team overall, I think they have the best depth in the Premier League. Um so it's a tricky one. I think United have struggled because there were a lot of their players that were away on internationals. They didn't get that much time to train. You saw the difference when they played even teams like Crystal Palace and Brighton, which when they played them last season in the second half of the season, the, it was really United were like in a training game when they're playing against them. And then suddenly they don't look up to the level. But then you see the Newcastle game and you see the PSG game. And the players look fit again. They look like it's it's not so much where they're lacking in that match sharpness anymore. And it's something that for Chelsea, it's a different story. When you sign whatever it was, seven, eight players, 
that's difficult in a normal season to bed them all in because no manager in a transfer window is going to bat 100%. There's always going to be three or four of those players, especially when you sign seven or eight that aren't going to work out. So the issue is not having that preseason is it puts some of those new players on kind of the harder slope to be successful early on. And that's why I always thought it was, it was a difficult task that Chelsea are going to have because expectations are most likely through the roof because when you spend the amount of money you do, you expect to be up with City and Liverpool. But in reality, that's very difficult to actually happen. Yeah, fantastic points. Tom, I'm going to bring you in here. Kieran, I see you nodding. I think you agree. Look, do you think the Chelsea fan base got a bit overexcited? I mean, I look at your business, and I did say this plenty of times on my podcast, obviously, I do a few podcasts with it with the United fans. There's four of us to do a show together. And I've said, haven't I, Kieran, the whole way through, I'm really impressed with Chelsea's business because Timo Werner is someone that I really wanted at United. And to say that, oh, we had Martial, he's still a very good player, but for 50 million, looking at Werner's stats last last year as well, one he was up there, got a combined goal and, goal and assists. I believe he was just behind Lewandowski. Top, top player. Last weekend, he showed what he can really do. Kai Havertz is going to be one of the best players around but he's very, very highly rated. I'll be honest with you on that one. I think it, it, that one I always thought was going to take a bit of time to settle. He's coming with such big expectations, I think, and with such a big price tag, it's, it's it's difficult. Whichever player you are, whichever club you do join, you look over, I think ZX can be a very good signing. So when you look at just those three, do you think Chelsea fans got a bit too excited at the prospect of three brilliant players coming in that they expected you guys and these players to just hit the ground running and, because it hasn't happened that there is a bit of discourse in the fan base. Cause I have seen a lot of Chelsea fans be very upset at what's happened so far. Can you hear us, mate? Yeah. I mean, I think you always are going to get fans before the start of a season saying I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah. I'll edit this bit out. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Sorry. So you'll always get. So you'll always get at the start of a season. I think fans that will say, you know, that your team's going to win the treble. You know, you get United fans going, our team's going to win the treble. You get Chelsea fans saying it'll be two thousand four five again. I think the majority were kind of cautiously optimistic. Were hoping that we'd get. You know, a solid top three, maybe a cup, Champions League quarter final for the first time since I think 2014. And I still think we can achieve all those things, but there were fans that clearly thought we could challenge for the league. I never thought we would. Um, you know, it took four years for Klopp. It will take similar for Solskjaer, similar to that for Lampard, I think. Um, and in terms of the transfers, I guess the, the, the best thing I can compare to with United was when Mourinho brought in, or was it Mkhitaryan, Ibrahimovic, Pogba, by all in that summer of 2016. And, you know, you got what you needed that season, but you didn't start particularly quickly. I think you came sixth and won the Europa League that yeah, year. Yeah, we did. Uh, so I, I guess I'd compare it to that as a most similar thing. Because people forget how depleted our squad was last season. I mean, to say we got top four with that squad, when I look at Tottenham and Arsenal, who I actually think possibly had better squads than us, for me, I think people almost took that top four last year as a right to get top four this year. And I'm not so sure that's true. That's very interesting. I mean, look, I'm probably going to disagree with you on... Not so much the squad, but I think when it takes time to bed players in, I'll bring you in, Kieran, because I know you agree with that. But any manager, this is not necessarily aimed at Chelsea and Lampard, but any manager that gets backed so well like Abramovich has, Kieran, and any manager who essentially fixes nearly every single problem area in the team, it takes time to bed in. But you would expect, I know if I was, if this was United and they went and bought a centre back like we need, a defensive midfielder, they sorted out the striker position like they have done, a right winger. I would expect Oli to challenge. I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, I completely agree. Look, 
it, let's put this in the context that if United ended up signing their top target, so obviously there was Sancho for that right wing, so let's compare him to when Havertz came in, because it's similar enough in terms of the size of the deals. Let's say you brought in a striker in the similar ilk to kind of Werner in terms of that kind of price range even, and then you had someone like Upa Meccano come in and centre-back. If United brought those players in and we were having the results that Chelsea or even to a certain extent that we've had early on I'd be very worried as a United fan because I'm like the problem areas that we had last season which really towards the end of the season it didn't look like there was loads and you were performing worse than last season I'd be worried for Lampard to and I think the difference is because Lampard has brought in so many players I said it while it was happening that you can't bring in seven to eight players and expect them all to hit the ground running. Sometimes you have the player like Bruno that comes in and it doesn't take long and they can come straight in. But then you have other players that, and I'll just use United's examples, like Nemanja Vidic and Patrice Evra, who come in halfway through a season and really didn't look good. But then when they get the time with the team, they are never taken out of the team again. And they look like two of the kind of better defenders in that team for a good part of a decade. Chelsea is a weird one for me because I see the attacking talent. I don't see the plan defensively. And it's a big issue. Bring in, when for me, when Thiago Silva is your main kind of defensive option at centre-back, that's a big problem because this isn't Thiago Silva of when he was... 26 or 27 he doesn't have probably the best centre back in the world yeah, at the time wasn't he, he he doesn't have that pace and that's what you expect from Chelsea to have kind of those because that's what they were built on when Mourinho was there you saw kind of Carvalho and, and Terry when they brought out you saw <coughs> other players come in and you always knew it was going to be hard to break Chelsea down and then you had to worry about the likes of Drogba on in the attacking side of the game for me I see if you're able to defend well against Chelsea and cast them out on the break I think they're very, very vulnerable. And it's obvious why Lampard was looking at Declan Rice at the end of the transfer window because he knew there's not that balance in the team. And that's going to be a big issue for Chelsea going forward. The other problem I have is, and I know this was a problem with Ziyech not being there early on, but the position areas that they were playing, Kai Havertz, was completely wrong. And all you have to do is look at the Leverkusen games. When he was being played out wide, he wasn't as dominant in terms of in the game as when he was behind the striker. And then the first game back, he or Lampard decides to play Loftus and Cheek behind the striker and plays Kai Havertz out in the right wing. And for me, you just have to look at kind of the like the last kind of year or two when Kai Havertz is central, he influences the game. When he's out wide, he's not involved in the game. He was linked to so many teams last season before Chelsea brought him in. He was linked to United. And while he was a good player, he wasn't the player that I kind of wanted us to bring in because I didn't know how effective he was going to be. Then he had a great season with Leverkusen and his price tag speaks for himself. But he needs to be played in the right position and I don't think he's been in that position. Now, that may have just been because Pulisic and... Ziyech weren't fully fit and maybe now that they're back into the side I don't know if they're completely fully fit back into it I haven't got I didn't see the Champions League game or anything for Chelsea um but if they are then that can only accommodate Havertz and should help Werner up front as well yeah fantastic points I, I agree with that completely and Tom I'm going to bring you in there yeah. Kieran talks about that, that balance, right? So going forward, I watched, I've watched Chelsea quite a lot this season and I watched against Southampton, devastating in that first half, absolutely devastating. I thought the interchanging was brilliant. There was a lot of one-touch football. Werner scared me because we'll talk about sort of United's weaknesses in a bit, but if we're playing Maguire and Lindelof, that is, we're going to get exposed completely. We'll play a high line the same way that we'd say to you, okay, yes, we can expose your defence. You can do the same to us. That, hence why there's a lot of similarities between the teams. But defensively, and I guess we can bring Lampard into this now because I think I, I think of it two ways. I talk to a lot of my friends at Chelsea fans. You've got some Chelsea fans who will defend him to the hilt, very similar in the United fan base, where for, uh, Oli can do no wrong. And there's a lot of blind faith. And I'm not someone who ever does blind faith to anyone. 
as a Man United fan, I want the best manager at the club to do the best for the club. And at the end of the day, you could be Mickey Mouse, you could be Sir Alex Ferguson. If you're not performing and the team isn't playing to the way they should be, then you're, you should be held to that standard. You should be judged on that standard. Looking at Frank Lampard, going forward, I think Chelsea really are, I think they're brilliant at times. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. But it's the old adage that defences win titles and attacks win games. Now that Frank's had the job for, well, it's over a season now, I don't see, as an outsider, a defensive system or a defensive plan. Now, there's managers with lesser players getting them more organised. Is that a concern for you? And is it fair to question whether Lampard got the job too soon? Yeah, so I questioned Lampard a lot. Um, I think it was after the Tottenham Carabao Cup game. We lost on penalties. That in itself didn't annoy me. But I was getting very annoyed that Lampard was playing a different formation every game with different players every game. I think I'd said that last season, and I wrote after the Sheffield United defeat, that we had about 16 or 17 different defensive combinations in a season. That's just unacceptable for me. You know, you have to choose a settled back line. What did Mourinho do? Ferguson do? Wenger do? They create a settled back line and they don't change it unless there's injury or, you know, a player is literally out on his feet. So, yeah, I... I was questioning him after that. I, I would never be at a stage where I'd say, Frank Lampard, leave the club, you're a disgrace. But I was at a point where I was going to say, he's got to make serious changes. Um, and then he started after that game playing 4 2 3 1, a little bit like Solskjaer does with United. He's played that every game since. I think he now knows his best back four. And I think he's going to be willing to play it. I think. He brought in a defensive coach over the summer from Wigan, uh, Anthony Barry, who is who promises a lot. And I think parts of our defence have actually improved this season. He's very uh, highly rated, isn't he, Tom? Anthony Barry. He is. He is. And I think the best time that was shown was against Liverpool, where until Christensen goes and decides to play rugby and pretends he's at Twickenham, about 20 miles on the bridge, <laughs> we, were, we, we, we were defending brilliantly. We, you know, we, we weren't, you know, it didn't look like we were a vulnerable side. So then he starts playing this formation. And my hope for tomorrow is, or for today, if it goes up today on the game day, is that he keeps that 4 2 3 1 shape and he keeps playing the way he wants because I'm worried that he'll do what sometimes Solskjaer does and play a back five and go back five, play more defensively. And while it might win us the game, I don't think it necessarily will, but it might. I don't think it'll actually do us any favours going forward because we have to play the best in our best system with our best players and suddenly we'll get better and better and better at doing it. What is your best system? Because I'm quite intrigued because... You mentioned the three at the back, and I'll bring Kieran in after your, your answer, because mm. actually, for me, I hope United play three at the back, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But what is your best system, and what's your best first 11? Because I'm quite intrigued to actually yeah. hear that. So what Solskjaer has done well is that he's got a primary system that he uses, that 4 2 3 one, right? And in the big games, when he needs to change it up, he goes to that 3 4 one, two, or that 3 5 2 um, and that works well, I thought. It didn't work well against us in, at Wembley last year, but it worked against us at the bridge a couple of times. Um, and I like that. But Lampard at the moment just needs to get that first choice shape. I don't think he's in a position to be playing around with two or three shapes at the moment. For me, I would personally play a 4-3-3. If it were up to me, and I didn't talk about what the manager would do, I'd play 4-3-3. Jorginho at the base, probably Kante next to him and Havertz or Mount next to, next to that. But I think Lampard wants to build the 4-2-3-1. And for that reason, that's what I want him to play. For me, our best 11, right? Obviously, Eddie Mendy in goal, because our other goalies are either either have walking Well, that's better check. <laughs> I mean, it tells you that you know, you wouldn't believe that we've just spent 70 million on the world's most expensive keeper, would you? Exactly. 
and 30 million spoken, on another. Yeah, but it's not spoken about enough, Tom, because... Oh, it is amongst our fans. Is, yeah, I've seen a lot with your fans, but it's <laughs> it's really... That's a huge issue, isn't it? And I spoke to a French journalist about Mendy. I mean, look, I don't know enough about him, but I did ask at the time because he we were doing sort of transfers. This was before Mendy joined, and he said, Mendy's a good player, but he's surprised that Chelsea have gone for him because he he's not... You know, out, an outstanding keeper, if that makes sense. He played. He played for Rennes, and I think that no French journalist is going to look at a Rennes player and say that they're world class at that stage. So I, I'm not on that alone worried. I think it was a good move. It was kind of the antidote to Kepa not pay through the roof. I think 22 million was all we paid for him, which for a goalkeeper is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, but. It's not going to put him at a tenth of the pressure that Kepa was under when he first joined Chelsea. And from what we've already seen, he's already an upgrade on Kepa and Caballero. Um, he can That's save shots. Oh, no, 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 you're spot on. You're spot on. Um, and I think that makes a difference because I think your back line is only as good as your goalkeeper gives him the confidence to be. So I go through our team and Eddie Mendy's really, really important because you could see when he got injured against Southampton, Kepa was embarrassing. And embarrassing is not a word I like to use in our own players. But I can't think of another word that fits the bill there. So I go into the back four, and for me it picks itself, and I hope for Lampard it picks itself. Chilwell, Zuma, Thiago Silva, and probably P against Man United. Uh, just a better defensive player. I think Rhys James is brilliant in the attacking phase. His crosses are amazing, but um, I prefer Respi. I don't know if you guys know, by the way, a fun fact that Rhys James' sister plays for Manchester United women. Um, really? I did not know that. Another fun Lauren fact, James. my cousin yeah. went to school with Rhys James and like he's good friends with him. So, yeah, that was funny. He's like, you know this guy called Rhys James? This was a couple of years ago. And I said, yeah, I've heard of him. And then next thing you know, he's he's a Premier League right back for Chelsea. I think he's a fantastic player, mate, Rhys James. Yeah. And when we, we do a fantasy football show and we were looking at him, to him yesterday and his attacking returns are, are phenomenal. But again, he's a, he's a rotation risk, isn't he? I, I think Lampard probably will go for Azpilicueta, especially if you play three at the back and Tellez is pretty much playing as a left winger. Tellez looks dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Is it me or was there a United youth player called Rhys James a few years ago? It was, yeah. It was, yeah. I got them mixed up at one point. I thought we'd signed Rhys James, our Rhys James from Man United. <laughs> so uh, I. And, they, and they don't look that different either. <laughs> they were very similar <laughs> in, term, in terms of stature and how they played. It was very confusing when I heard Rhys James. and like, that's a weird name coming back to me again. That was years ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about it's six or seven years, years ago. ago. Yeah. So then... Our midfield two would be Jorginho and Kante. As much as I don't really like Kante in a 4-2-3-1, and I would personally be inclined to go for Kovacic because I think he's a slightly more rounded player. I think Kante is a go for this game also because he knows Pogba. He'll be able to be on Pogba, which will be important. I play Havertz behind the striker. My two wingers, Pulisic and hopefully Ziyech. Although it could well be Mason Mount, obviously it will it will be Mason Mount because that's the thing. Look, Please. Mason. My question on Mason Mounts, and I'm guessing it's uh, Werner up front. That would be your final player. Yeah, yeah Tammy, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, the thing is, I mean, that's look. I that's love a Tammy. Very... No, no, I love Tammy. Like, I, I don't want to laugh at Tammy Abraham because he's brilliant, and I'd love to see him play more. But I is don't really want to put Werner on left. Is he, is he third Sorry? choice? Is he third choice after Giroud? Second choice. Second choice. <laughs> I, I actually find it hard because I think he's he's a bit disrespectful to Giroud in that he bins Giroud until he needs him. And it's kind of like he really doesn't want to play Giroud style of football. But then when we need the points, he whips Giroud out the locker. I don't really like it, but I can see why, you know, Abraham is the future. I think he can be a very good player and he needs more chances. But then when you go out of the League Cup so early, what, what do you expect? And yeah. Giroud was massive to your chances of top four last season after the restart. He was probably, he was probably one of the top players. When I say United's players were up there. They were fantastic after the restart. But Giroud, almost single-handedly, single um, you know, he, he made Maguire's 
day of misery at uh, Wembley and he knocked you out of the cup, yeah. Yeah, he did. And that, oh, yeah. that was that was a difficult one to start. But Tom, so so that's a good first I would say that's a strong first eleven, but sort of looking at it and you you mentioned that Lampard struggles with his primary system, but why is that? Because the question I do want to ask you, I don't want this is not about me bashing Lampard because I, I'm not saying no, I actually no, feel no, sorry no. for him. The reason why I feel sorry for him is because he's been given the job a year after his first like one year of, of management, the first season. And that's you got to look at Ollie as well. Like Ollie's had 14 years of management. I'm one of the United fans, and Kieran knows this. I'm not particularly high on Solskjaer, but what I will say with, uh, for Solskjaer, I suppose, over Lampard is that Solskjaer can organize a defense. Whatever anyone says, my my problems with Oli is not so much been the defense. My issue is going forward. Come on, let's have a little bit more attacking, um, more patterns, quicker one to one touch football. You know, something a bit more, something a bit more creative. Um, and he, he he shows he can do it, but defensively, that's a real worry. And it's not that Fran, uh, Frank Lampard is not going to be a good manager in the future, but he's been given one of the biggest jobs in England, and. How much time does he have to turn this around? Because lose a couple more, Abramovich is synonymous for, get, you know, chopping someone. Whether it's Jose Mourinho, Antonio Conte, Carlo Ancelotti, will Lampard be given more time? And and why can't he find his primary system? What's the issues there? So for me, and you compare to Oli, and I think it's quite a good comparison. What I like about Oli, and I liked about Oli all of last season when the, when the going got tough, and then when the going got better, he had a system. He stuck to it and then he developed a backup for when the going got tough and he used it sparingly, but when he needed to, and it got him results. I remember at City, it got him results everywhere he went. What Lampard showed last year, and I think it showed his inexperience, was the fact that he toyed with a number of shapes. And I think he thought he'd land on one eventually and the one he landed on would be the jackpot. We'd do a Conte, we'd win 14 or 13 on the, on, the, on the run, and suddenly we'd be a team. And I think he thought that slightly at the start of this season. He played that 4-4-2, four, like four, four, I, I can't even tell you what shape that was when we played at the start against uh, Brighton. Four, one, 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 one. Oh, goodness <laughs> me, it, it was painful. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought we were actually worse in that game than we were against Liverpool. Uh, even though we won that one and lost to Liverpool. But then I I think he's realised, yes, we might not get perfect results every time if we stick to a shape. But what will happen is players get used to each other. You'll get partnerships building, a bit like, again, United have done with that front four. And eventually the results will come again. I look at United post-restart, perfect example of that. So I have faith that since he started doing that, we can actually build a good, um, like a good side, a good system. And that's why I say I'd be worried if he, if he started going to something different tomorrow. Even if we lose or we draw, if he stuck with that system, we've played well, we're building partnerships, I'm fine with that. And you talk about like managerial sackings, I think, and I think I've said this a little while, I think Roman's attitude to coaches has changed. I think with Conte, I I dislike Conte profusely, actually, because of the way he dealt with our club that second year. He just binned us. He's doing the same at Inter, by the way. It's it's, it's a recurring theme in his careers. He's. Oh, he was about to go. Yeah, I love Antonio Conte. I love his passion. Uh, I love I love his system as well because when it works, it's a it's a thing of joy. That three five two that you played the season you won the league. I thought that was beautiful, me personally. But I would not have anywhere near Man United. I was actually tweeting this yesterday because he is such a bad apple. He's got exactly oh, where he wants to enter, and he's still complaining and he he's might. toxic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And I think as well, to be honest with you, with Conte, he he binned us. By the way that you talk about his passion that first year, I got the impression, judged by his behaviour the second year, that he just kind of switched that off. It was all fake because the second year he looked like a miserable guts. He looked like he'd just been, you know, he looked like someone had basically spat in his cereals. He and 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 it was for me that second year was the most joyless season, and that's including the 15-16 year. 
I found the, the seventeen eighteen year even worse than that, actually. Wow. That was the Jose year, wasn't it? Because that year I saw youth products, I saw us, you know, kind of say we need to look longer term. We got rid of Mourinho, which was unfortunate. I love the guy. He had always been my heart. And, and and I could see a change in the club by the end of that year. 2017-18 was vile. And then when Conte came back to at the start of pre-season training the season after, because we hadn't agreed compensation with him, that was a marker of the the depth and the unpleasantness of the man that we were dealing with, I thought. And then with Sarri, we gave Sarri a season. In previous times, we'd have sacked Sarri after losing 4-0 to Bournemouth or whatever it was. Um, I'm convinced of that. So I think Roman's attitude has actually changed. Um, I think as long as Lampard gets top four this season, we'll be all right. Um, but yes, I agree we have to build from top four. Top four for United, top four for Chelsea. It's not acceptable. It's not It's not what a club should be celebrating year on year. I certainly wasn't celebrating after we beat Wolves at the end of last season. You know, we're, we're not... We're... That's Arsenal's job, isn't it, to go and do that, to celebrate the top four trophy. Kieran, honestly, Tom makes some fantastic points. I don't think I disagree with anything Tom said. Honestly, I want to bring you in here, but he talks about the 3-5-2. He doesn't want to see Chelsea go towards that. But what we saw against PSG, actually, looking at our squad, we missed out on Jadon Sancho, which was the most unfortunate thing ever. Oh, I hate his seeing his name pop up again. You know, it's it's just not nice, is it? We know that. But, you know, he's he's obviously not got his centre-back that he wanted to come in, Luka Makano, someone of that ilk. So you're looking at the squad now. 3-5-2 suits exactly what we have. Now, moving forward, I think United probably will play similar. We might see Pogba come in for one of the midfield boys, maybe McTominay, so that we have more ability in midfield. But... I expect us to play that low block again because we know that if we can break on uh, at pace at this Chelsea defence, there is definitely chances and goals to be had. Do you agree with that? Yeah, completely. I don't think you're going to see a, a huge change to the team. It's a it's a tough one because from before when it seemed like the team was so obvious to choose from, now it's very difficult. And that's, that's good for, for us. Look, if I was going with my kind of defensive idea, that's the one that I always have to toy with because, look, I think Maguire probably is fit for the game. I think he was just given that time off for the PSG game. You obviously have De Gea and goal, and then having Dean Henderson as a backup is, is great. I'd say Chelsea fans would be wishing they had one of those. Romero players. as well. Romero is a player yeah. that Chelsea could do with. He's a fantastic keeper. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I, we treat him I, terribly I would say, wrong. though, I would say personally... And I don't know if, if this is echoed amongst most United fans. I think it's a bit of a disgrace that De Gea is actually playing above Dean Henderson. I don't think De Gea has been as good as Dean Henderson for a while now. Yeah, I, th- I, I think the difference is that it's if you get rid of De Gea straight away, that means he has to be sold because it means that you've now replaced kind of the starter. It's... Right now, I think De Gea has had a pretty decent start to the yeah, season. So. Same, same with Dean Henderson. And look, Henderson just signed a six or seven year extension with United. So look, the club have basically said you're the future. But if they're going to plan on selling De Gea, you can't let you can't sell him after a poor season. You have to make sure that can you get something back for an asset. That's what I think is going to happen. De Gea probably is the goalkeeper for a year or two, and then Henderson takes over, and you have a pretty seamless transition from one to the other. Um, I think the amount of rows I had with Chelsea fans all of last year who thought that they could get Henderson, even though he was a United player, was ridiculous. Um, But then you look at the back, I'm going to say back five. I agree with you. The... But it's similar. Well, quickly, Kieran, similar. I agree with you that it's kind of like with Declan Rice, isn't it, Tom? Where you, I've seen United fans say, "Oh, we can get Declan Rice." Declan Rice is Chelsea through and through. I, I've yeah. spoken to a few people. Nah, he's... He'll play in goal for Chelsea if that means he can go back. Oh, and yeah, it's similar yeah. with Dick Henderson. Henderson's United through and through, and there's very rare players out there who are that loyal. And Declan Rice will be a Chelsea player next summer. I'm convinced. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I'm I... into it as well. Yeah. I, I don't know if he's what we need. Although a lot of people are confident, I, I, you know, I'll back him. 
I don't know if he's going to be the base of a midfield three that I think lots of people say he Lampard wants him to be. But I agree with you completely, Chelsea through and through. Um, I'd like to see him play at centre back personally, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, for me, I've for Declan Rice, I never thought he was the greatest player, and I like I saw him the odd game when he played for Ireland, and I still didn't think he was he was that great. Now compared to the rest of our players, <laughs> it was it was different, but. I've only really seen him being impressive the odd game when I've watched West Ham. He's still, for me, he's still, you don't see him enough in the game. And as a defensive midfielder, that's who you expect to see them being very active. If there was any player that I want, and actually a story came out about them, it was Zakaria. Um, he's the one, one player. player. He's the one so player great. that. Yeah, he's the one player that reminds me of Michael Essien, who it was probably one of my favorite players that didn't play for man united in the premier league he was he was a class act he was one of those that you could enjoy some of the goals he scored was ridiculous but Oof. even even other than that his defensive work rate was was insane and that's the type of player you don't see that often so i think he's one that you'll see a lot of teams go after and look there's reports that came out this week that there's about five teams that want them so that's going to be an expensive one but Look, if Lampard wants Declan Rice, that makes it easier for United to go after him. So hopefully that's the case. Um, in terms of the defense, I think there's not too much that is going to be a surprise. You're going to have Aaron Wan-Bissaka, the right wing back position. Then the three in center back is a difficult one. I think Axel probably starts because I think he had that good of a game against PSG and there's been a lot of talk about him in the media this week, even from Solskjaer and there's been a lot of people bringing him up. I think he probably starts. You see probably one of Linda Loffer and Maguire in the central part of that kind of three. You probably see Luke Shaw on the left side at centre back and then you'll have Alex Tellez on the left wing back. That's how I see this going to happen because the way Lindelof played against PSG, you could easily see Harry Maguire doing the same. He didn't have to do that much running. He just needed to control the defense. And you saw Lindelof be one of the ones to come up and win a lot of headers, which normally you don't see Lindelof do. So you could easily see Harry Maguire do that. Where it gets tricky is the midfield and the attack. Because yeah. you have to wonder is if United expect Chelsea to have a lot of the ball and to attack you may see Fred and McTominay play again together. I think Fred starts no matter what. I don't. I think he's going to be one of the first players. No, Matic? I don't think so. I think against Chelsea, you want someone to break up the play quickly and then, to, and then to kind of spread it out. That's why there's the possibility you might play Matic and then have Fred in there. The only thing is, I agree to what you said, Hayter, is like you might want to have Pogba in there to control the midfield. And then obviously you have Bruno and then the split strikers, which it's a hard one because Rashford definitely plays, but then you're picking between Cavani and Greenwood, one or the other. Do you want Cavani to be able to be that kind of bulldozer up front and kind of deal with some of the Chelsea backs? Or do you want to have uh, Greenwood as well? Yeah. Be or, or do you want to have Greenwood there that if he gets a chance, he probably scores. So it's, yeah. It's a, it's a tricky one, but I think where this game probably defines what happens is in the midfield. And right now, I think Man United's overall depth in the midfield is at a higher standard than Chelsea. Because if something doesn't work, let's say they stick with the same midfield where it's McTominay, Fred, and Bruno. They have the idea to bring Matic on if they need more stability. They could bring Pogba on. They could bring on Van de Beek. There's so many different options, which for Chelsea, I don't see the obvious options. Yes, you have between, what is it, Mason Mount and... Kovacic. Yeah. But does that change a game on its head for Chelsea? I don't always see that. I see like Mason Mount's a good... He worked hard for the team, and you can't deny him of that. But when you have to compare... A player like that to Pogba, or you have to compare that to Van der Beek. It's just at different levels right now. I forgot about Van der Beek, and I've been shouting for Van der Beek to play I, more. I, and more. That, I said it last week. Mm -hmm. I said it last week. I think this is a game that Van der Beek could come on and 
easily be kind of the difference and score a winning goal because he has that knack of being able to get into the box and get into those kind of pivots where you don't see a lot of kind of the defense pick him up and gets a free chance on goal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's some fantastic points. Tom, I'm going to come to you, um, our second last topic, and we're going to talk about sort of the strengths and weaknesses of Chelsea. Can you just name a few of them and what what worries you about United? And then I'll do the same for Kieran. So in terms of Chelsea's strengths and weaknesses, for me, um, I think our attack can do... I think what, what is bonkers about this side, having come, come in off a three-all draw and a nil-nil draw, is... One one game our attack functions. We, we you know we score three, um, but then we concede three. The next game our defence is really good, but we can't score and we look completely blocked off. But if I was to look more generally, I'd say our attack's definitely better than our defence. I think Sevilla are underestimated. I think their result against you guys at the end of last year showed it. And therefore, you know, this is why I looked at lots of fans go from Chelsea saying, oh, we should be beating them. You know, I thought that was quite entitled. I don't think we were definitely not entitled to beat them. Um, so for me, it's an inconsistency that scares me in terms of weaknesses. In terms of strengths, we have some amazing players and Werner's shown up. Havertz has shown up for us. I, I admit, you know, obviously it was in the Carabao Cup. He scores a hat trick on debut at home. He scores uh, last week against Southampton. So we have amazing players with the talent to beat Man United. And I actually think, you know, our players are as good as yours. But for me, and I've and I've said it, I said it before I came on here, I'll say it again. We're we're trying to do what United are doing, a similar sort of thing, but I think we're six months behind. Yeah, fantastic points. Uh, I'm going to come back to you quickly as well. Who pick pick one player who plays for United that you are concerned about that could be a threat? A threat as in a player we can exploit, or a threat as in a player that we should be scared of? That you should be scared of. Ooh. So, I think Cavani is the sort of player you bring on after 70 minutes if it's nil nil, and I would be terrified. Because players have a knack of scoring their first goal for a club against us. Um, in terms of a starter, for me, I think Bruno could run Jorginho and Kante ragged in that number 10. Um, and I think Mason Greenwood is an outstanding player. Him and Rashford next to each other against our back two, I think that could be carnage. So those are the areas I look at. Um, in terms of like Victor Lindelof, you talk about earlier, my grandmother's Swedish, so I watch a lot of the Swedish national team. If he came, if the player I see when I watch Sweden play came out for United, I would be terrified. But I've not seen that same player in the United shirt. Yeah, you made fantastic points. On Lindelof, Kieran, at Benfica, he was a world beater. I know it's at Benfica, people might complain. But he was a really, really good player. He was one of the most highly sought after and highly rated centre-backs in the league. And it just hasn't worked out for him. I honestly think, this is my opinion, I'm not the highest on Harry Maguire, but I think you put Lindelof next to Axel in the two, you'll see a completely different player from Lindelof because you've got a player that's aggressive next to him who's got the recovery pace. Um, I just think that works better. But talk to me, Kieran, about some of our strengths that you think can exploit Chelsea, some of our weaknesses, and name me a few players that you're quite worried about. I know Werner I'm worried about. I'll be honest with you. I'm I'm really worried about Werner. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think our strengths are probably the pace of our attack. You saw it against Paris Saint-Germain that if they get space, if you give Bruno, if you give Rashford space, same thing with Greenwood or even with some of the midfield players in Pogba, I think that they can rip apart teams when they're on their day. You saw it a, a couple of times last year. We played against Man City. I think we beat City four times last year. We beat Chelsea three times. We were the first team really to kind of give Liverpool any bit of a trouble. Um, and really, playing against PSG on Tuesday, we controlled most of the game. It wasn't a very difficult game when you actually go back and analyze it. There was a couple hard chances, but that happens when you play against Neymar and Mbappe. If 
they didn't have those kind of world-class players in the Neymar and Mbappe, it would have been a very straightforward win, I think, for United. Where I think United have been stronger, and I, I said it before, than Chelsea's, I just think those midfield options can really, it can depend. If Solskjaer gets that midfield right, I think United win the game. I think Agreed. if he if there's an issue in the midfield for United, that's when you're going to see kind of where they might struggle. It's just we have so many creative midfielders, but also you have those workmen-like midfielders that will do a job. You saw it with Fred and McTominay, how they really neutralized what Mbappe and Neymar were doing. And when they got past, you saw the defenders work in unison with the two defensive midfielders that once Neymar and Mbappe came past, somebody picked them up. It happened all the time. McTominay was kind of the main one that was that was working on Neymar. But you saw every time Mbappe came near Fred, once he got past there, Axel steps out. So they work together as a duo there, which you don't see that often. But when you play with those three centre-backs, you can do that because there's still options behind you. And also what ends up happening there is you see, because Scott McTominay plays in a back three for Scotland, that what he just did is he stepped into that position where Axel, when he would have to come out with Mbappe, you can look back in that game where I think Mbappe came to kind of collect the ball in midfield and Axel was right there with him. So he ha- he saw what the danger was there. I think if you play Axel in the game, you probably have someone who's going to look, he's going to shadow Werner because the one thing that I heard and I didn't like and for a Chelsea perspective is that first game that Werner played when he mentioned that I've never played against kind of these big center backs. Well, Axel's athletic. He's probably yes. the, one of the fastest players on the United yes. team. And he, he kept up with Mbappe yeah. three times. And he's yeah. one of the strongest players on the team as well. He's he's one that if he's fully fit and he's playing, it's going to be a difficult day for Werner, in my opinion, which United need to be able to try and neutralize. Because going to kind of your last question, I think Werner and Ziyech are the two players that United have to look out for. Because I think Ziyech can, if he plays, I don't know what kind of his availability is for the weekend. But if he plays, he's the one that can make that killer pass. That can so creative. Yeah, yeah that pass from when he comes a bit deeper on that right flank and plays that that ball into the box. Yeah, uh, you know, with with the left winger, let's say Pulis is running or Werner's coming in from the out from out to in. I'm worried about that. Yeah, he reminds me of a similar type of Juan Mata or David Silva when they're at Valencia. Um, he, he just plays those kind of really good passes. The other one, obviously, is if Werner's on good form, he's the one that can damage you. But then, like you said before, that there's been a lot of inconsistency. Like, I watched that first game for Chelsea. I watched the game against Liverpool. And a lot of the chances that Werner had, his control let him down, and then it just allowed the defence to kind of swarm. Mm. If United play it with that back five, if your touch isn't right, they're going to come and they're going to get the ball. And the problem is... And we saw it against PSG is when there was mistakes of ball control from any of the attacking players, you had Fred and McTominay get the ball and suddenly it's gone and it hits Bruno and goes up to Rashford and there was a lot of chances. I think if United are clinical against Chelsea, I think they win the game because I think they're going to have a good structure defensively. We mentioned the FA Cup game, but look, at that stage, the United players were, and we said it for weeks, they were out of gas at that stage. They were done. The season... They were hoping that the season would end soon enough because you could tell we, as United fans, we were saying, where where are we going to win this? Because we need to score early because the players look exhausted. And well, he got it so we, wrong as well, we, though, Kieran. You look at the selection. He went halfway oh, yeah. house. He rested half the no, team, that's changed the, the formation. Yeah, I, I, said, I said at the time, I said at the time is that he should have just used his bench players for that FA Cup game. It wasn't as important as getting in the top four for the Premier League. And he played half the team, and then they were still tired for the next week. It was the wrong system. But again, I think if we're comparing it to kind of games we need to look at, I think you probably have to look at the Premier League games from last year because that's when both teams were kind of set up to try and attack the other team. And it's it's a difficult one this weekend. I think there's a lot of key matchups there, both United defensively and 
really in these big games between Chelsea and United, generally the team that dominates the midfield tends to win the game. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen that the last few years. Fantastic insight. Tom, I'm going to come to you for your match yeah. prediction. This is a tough one because I'm not particularly confident. I don't think either side is that confident at all because both sides are consistently inconsistent. Man United yeah. have gone and beaten PSG, but then they could easily go and get beat by mm. Palace. Chelsea, yeah, yeah. you know, they can look at brilliant and go and smash um, Palace 4 0, but then, and they can go and score goals in a flurry, but then they can yeah. go and concede four and a half, like three against Southampton. Mm. So, talk to me about what your prediction is and yeah. are you confident? So, I'll respond to a couple of Kieran's points actually. So, yeah, Zinek go for it. Probably isn't going to start, unfortunately. I think he is an amazing player and he's everything that you guys say. I just think he's not completely fit. He came on against Sevilla. He didn't look a million dollars, if I'm honest with you. I think on Solskjaer, I've always rated Solskjaer's ability to line up for a big game. I think yeah. lots of Chelsea fans going, oh, we've got United, it'll be easy, they're terrible. That you know, I think United sometimes against the less good sides under Solskjaer, maybe he doesn't get it right. But I think in the big games, 80% of the time, at least Solskjaer gets it right. And that's why I rate Solskjaer much highly as a manager, much more highly as a manager than most Chelsea fans. I think, to be honest with you, the most rival fans to United, most rival fans, you know, yeah. Norwegian PE teacher, no, no, no. I don't. Yeah, think it's, so. it's crazy, isn't it, though, Tom? It, I don't see a manager in the league that's as disrespected. I'm one of those that doesn't think Solskjaer's top bracket. I think that's fair to say. But the disrespect, like, you don't get to third if you're a PE teacher you don't beat PSG like that if you don't have no, tactics no, no. you don't win that many big games you're right it's the smaller games and it's nice to see a non United fan actually pick that out because I do think Tactically, that yeah in the big games he always gets it he almost always gets it spot on that's why in the cup game I was so surprised it was almost a walkover because I was convinced we were going to lose I thought Solskjaer He'll nail it. He'll pick a three, four, one, two. Lampard won't be able to respond. So when, obviously, I wasn't as clued up, so I didn't realise how tired the United boys were. When we won that, I was, I was absolutely, I was kind of gobsmacked, to be honest with you. Um, and I agree with you. He is disrespected. I think Lampard's getting similar levels of disrespect now. It's not necessarily surprising, given the fact that we've not had the best start. But yeah, I, I'd like to, I, I, I did want to put that on record on United show. I think he's a much better manager than people people say he is. Um, so so that was that was another point. That's why basically my prediction is going to be a United win because I just think what I want to see is Lampard continuing our system, continuing with the four two three one, so not changing it as he seems to always change it in a sort of a, any semi big game. Keep a style going, and if we get a draw, I'm happy. I mean, we haven't won at Old Trafford since 2013, and that hurts me because I remember really? that game. That last game we... Was that the matter? David Luiz got Raphael sent off? Yeah. Oh, mate. The game, you'd already won the league, though, so it wasn't... Yeah. yeah that, that, that tells you how long ago it was now. <laughs> yeah. Since David Moyes, we haven't beaten you at, at Old Trafford. <laughs> It feels like, um, honestly, it feels like we're Liverpool these days. It's been seven years. It's gone like that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it hurts because we always used to pride ourselves that even when we didn't have the investment, we had the best record in the Premier League against Man United. We, you know, even in 92-3, 93-4, we'd beat you home and away. And I don't know how we'd do it, but we'd always beat Man United. It, it was a weird record and it's one that, I think as a Chelsea fan, I'm kind of proud of in a way. I mean, particularly under Fergie, he'd always struggle against us. So the fact that we've really struggled against United since Fergie's left, in all honesty, it mystifies me as much as it mystifies anyone else. So that's why I'm, I'll am i say 2-1 to United. But what I want to see is us to progress. And if we do leave Old Trafford with three points, I'll be the happiest man in the world. That's a fantastic review. I, I completely agree. I used to hate playing Chelsea under Sir Alex Kieran because, you know, it felt that Chelsea were the bogey team and 
the, the one that stands out for me massively is the one where the, the year we won the t- last title that we won and uh, Van Persie was just on another level. Yeah. But um, looking at this game, Kieran, uh, just give me your prediction. I'm going to give you mine quickly. It honestly depends if we go with a back four or a back three. If we go back four, we will, I can see us losing because I just really? can't. Yeah, because because if okay, let me let me clarify. If he doesn't play Axel Tunzebi and he goes Maguire and Lindelof, which I've got a sneaky feeling he might do, if he goes short or left back and not Telez, United can very much lose this game because Werner's we we struggled against Spurs and Spurs's pace is Son really. I know Mora. Chelsea got so much more pace up top than Spurs have got, and Werner what he did against Southampton, he will do at United if we play a high line. Kieran, if United go with a three at the back, I think United are going to win 2-1. So that's what I'm going to go for. I think he'll, he won't change it. It's a big game. Even if we're at home, the fans aren't there. So it's not like they're going to get upset if we play more of a low block. But I'd be happy with that. And I think United will pivot 2-1. I think Chelsea will surprise a few, though. I think um, United United have got to be careful not to be complacent. A lot of, you're not, United fans are being very complacent, and I'm not liking that. Yeah, I think, I think the fans are complacent. I don't think the players are. After that drubbing that we got to spurs you could see the players attitudes have changed that they realized just how embarrassing that was and you've seen them play like that game against psg was the first time i think i've seen them play as a team in a long time even though we were beating teams pretty easily after the lockdown we were doing it on great attacking play and we weren't that great defensively but the game against psg was look the only goal that PSG scored was an own goal from Martial that any that happens at times. Other than that, there wasn't much else to kind of be worried about. I think if we play with that kind of back three or back five with two and Zabi there, I think we win the game. And I think it's probably 3-1. I think if we play with a back four, it's an issue because we've seen that we've we've struggled. If we play at the back four, you can expect Matic to play as the defensive midfield. I don't think it's the right option, but look, maybe he wants to change it up for the game. I expect it to be a very similar team to what played against PSG. You might see a bit of a change in midfield. You might see Maguire come in for Lindelof. Um, you might even see Tuanzebi, Maguire and Lindelof and Shaw out on the left wing back position if he wants to be a little bit more defensive. Um if we play with that, I expect us to win the game. It's it's difficult because we have both teams have been so inconsistent, so it's a hard one to judge. I just think with everything that's gone on, this is a game that I think both teams can't afford to lose. So exactly. it's a possibility yeah. that I think it's either going to be one of those really high scoring games where they attack each other from early on, or it's going to be one of those really really boring games where it's nil all or one nil but I'm hoping it's the attacking side and I'll go with a 3-1 victory for United. Absolutely. I think I think I can very much see both managers not wanting to lose. And maybe maybe it'd be good if Lampard did go up to set up similar, you know, play that low block and and really get us on the counter. Because I think Chelsea have got attributes to play on the counter fantastically well. Tom, no, no you don't want that. I'll no. let you have one more word. Tell, tell, me, tell me why you disagree with that. I'll tell you why, because... I think Lampard's resorted to that too much now. He's done that, you know, every other game he would literally change the shape. And I'm at a point now, and I said it, and the reason I've given him a lot more support the last few weeks is he's stuck with a shape, he's building his best back four, he's getting a system, and if he goes and plays a low block, it might work, you know, we might beat you, but it's all of a sudden, he'll, he'll, he'll then play it again the next week when we play a team. We'll play Krasnodar away and he'll keep playing it. And that's not what I want to see, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think with United, it's slightly different in that you've got two shapes that you've used all of last season and start of this season. And you can choose the one you're happiest with. I don't think we're in that position, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a fantastic point. I completely see where you're coming from. If that was me in that situation and we didn't have four two three one sort of nailed down, or we knew that we could flexibly go to three five two in attack with three four three, then yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from. Tom, this has been absolutely fantastic. Honestly, it's been nice to have a conversation where we're not, you know, 
digging each other's team out. We're just sitting there <laughs> being objective. So I really hope you've enjoyed it. I'd love to get you back on if you are interested. Oh, I've loved it. I've absolutely loved it. Because again, finding fans of other teams, that you, as I say, you talk about without the kind of Twitter or you know, <laughs> yeah, YouTube exactly. kind of, you're rubbish, we're better than you, we've won a European Cup. Yeah, it's not what I want to see. Exactly. I love talking football. And it doesn't Absolutely. matter who you support. That's what we do here. Yeah, that's exactly what we do here. It's uh, none of the sort of fan channel stuff. Tom, honestly, you're always welcome back on. We'll definitely get you back on. So thank you for coming on today. Kieran, my co-host, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today, mate. Absolutely. Thanks, Hader. No problem at all. Guys, make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and also give it a share. Give Tom a follow. I know his name is just covered up behind <laughs> Elite Football Show, so we'll chuck it in the description as well. Make sure you subscribe on Spotify as well, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere. Just type in the Leap Football Show and we will see you next time.